sermon this morning, we're going to be con- I'm going to be concluding that week with the one last thing, and uh, you know it's it's really the, of what the culture the culture that that uh, we want to be characterized by these six values that we that we've been going over, and I'm not talking about doctrine here. I'm talking about culture, right? And culture is the values that are reflected in everything that we do. So whatever it is we're doing, these are the these are the values. These are part of the culture of whatever we're doing falls in should fall into these, right? And so, um, anybody remember what the first one was? I repeat these every week. All right. Just looking for notes. All right. The first, you know, we talked about new life, right? It's on the sign. <laughs> you know, new life. We we want to we want to promote. The new life that that people have in Jesus Christ, and we also want to want people to experience the um, life more abundantly, as as Jesus promised us. He says, "I bring life, and I bring life more abundantly." That we're going to have it more abundantly. So having that life that's still growing, even after we get saved, you know, when we get saved and we start the new life, that's just the start. You know, we continue, we grow in that. And then the second thing I shared about was being excellent. You know. Uh, did you ever figure those out, Chris? The slides? Yep, yep. Uh, we should be on the second slide. But uh, but anyways, this is a uh, you know about how everything Scripture says that whatever you do to the Lord or whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, not unto men. Right? It tells us that whatever we're doing in life. We need to be doing it unto Jesus. That means we're, we're, we're raising the bar of excellence, right? Everything from what we do here at, in church to everything in our personal lives. Um, I tell you, there, there's kind of a culture around us right now where we would just want to say it's good enough. And and that's lowering the bar. That's like saying, well, I did, it was good enough. Nobody nobody wants to have a heart surgeon tell you he did good enough. Right? Or a brain surgeon. You know, nobody wants, you don't want somebody working on you saying, well, it was good enough. They didn't die. <laughs> right? I mean, that one survived. That's that's not the standard we want others to, to how we want in our lives. And so that's not the standard that, that we want to live to either. And the third one was, was the value of one more, about always keeping in front of us the importance of trying to reach one more person with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our job as disciples, as followers of Jesus, is to be fishers of men. So we should never be satisfied. It doesn't matter how many people you bring to the Lord, you should always be looking for that next one. That, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. It's, it's not complicated, it's, it's, but what happens, it's unfortunate, but it happens to almost everybody that comes to know Jesus. If you're not paying attention, all of a sudden you're satisfied in your own salvation. And you forget about everybody else. It's like, you know, me and, me and my household, we're good. I guess nobody else matters. And it's not that we get we definitely get like that, but but we lose focus. So always look into that one more. Number four was the value of teach truth, right? That, that I I can tell you that as long as I'm pastor here, you know, anybody that's going to be teaching our kids, anybody that's going to be teaching a women's group, a men's group, everything, anything that's being taught through New Life Assembly guys, it's going to be grounded in the Word of God. It's going to be the truth. It's not going to be watered down, sugar coated, or or twisted to make whatever message we want to portray to fit our own agendas. That's that's not what we're going to do here at New Life. Number five was disciple making. That's actually, for those of you that were here on my first Sunday here, when, when you all voted for, for me, right? That's what part for discipleship. I think it's really the area of the, the church in our culture today that that's the area of the church has dropped the ball. We want to get them to the point of saying the sinner's prayer, hand them the Bible, and say, good luck. Figure it out. That ain't the way Jesus did it. He selected people to draw in close, to spend intimate time with, to do life with, to teach them. And he spent three years with them, and they were still dysfunctional. Right? I mean, so so don't get, don't get frustrated when, when you're trying to disciple somebody, and they're still dysfunctional. The master disciple spent three years with 12 guys and still had at least three that were pretty dysfunctional. Okay. So, so I mean, it's 
all of us, all of us need to have somebody that's a mentor, somebody discipling us. Should also be discipling someone under us. And if you're brand new to the Lord, and and you say, well, I don't know yet. I don't know anything to teach me. Here's what I suggest you do. You invite somebody to take the journey with you. If you can't teach them, invite them to to start that journey, walking with the Lord, and your journey of discipleship. And you have somebody to walk together. Recall a couple weeks ago I shared on this. That's what Andrew, Peter's brother, did. He says, we found the, the Christ. Come and meet him. And they started that journey together. And so these five that were I just, we've, I've already went over and preached on. This is something our meet, uh, ministry leadership team put together um, that we thought these are the core values of our church. And then about two weeks ago, it dawned on me. It's like, you know what? There's a sixth one that really has got to be in this list. And, it, and it's the value of serving. I think it's something that's already part of the culture here. Uh, but I think it's something that, that is important for us to be mindful of is you know that that we are called to serve one another. We're called to serve people, and and I really think that in some of the things we've done in this last month, we've showed our community that we've shown we've shown people in our community that that we're here to serve. And so so that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. This number six is serving. All right. So if you have your Bibles uh, or or it's probably going to be on the screen too. But Mark chapter 9, verse 35, that's where we're going to start. Mark 9, 35. You write it down. So, it says, And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and a servant of all. You know, one of the key words in that phrase is all. You know, he, that's right, he says, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And so, so I wanted to start this morning with just taking a look at who is all. How do we, how do we fit into this? Because according to Jesus, that if you want to be somebody in the kingdom of God, you've got to be a servant of everybody. That's what he said. I'm not. I didn't make it up. You all see it, right? I know everybody brought their Bible, so I'm giving you guys hard time. <laughs> giving you a hard time this morning. I know it's on the on the thing, but that's what Jesus said. He says, "If you want to be somebody, you got to be nobody." Because in Jesus' day, the nobodies were the servants, right? If you were somebody, you had servants. So he's saying if, if you want to be the head, if you want to be a leader, if you want to be somebody that that is somebody in the kingdom of God, and I really think that when we talk about somebody being in the kingdom of God, uh, being somebody, what we're talking about is somebody who's effective in the kingdom of God. Somebody whose name, when, when Satan hears their name, they're like, he's like, oh, no, not them again. You, you, we've talked about this before. You want the devil to know your name. You know, if you were at war and, and there's this, this great general over there, everybody on the other side knows his name and they don't want that general coming at him. That's the way you want Satan to see you, is saying, I don't want that one coming after me. It's like, man, when you walk in the area, you want the devil to flee. That, that's who, who we want to be. But we don't get to be like that by walking around with our... our chest puffed up and saying, look at me, I'm this great somebody in the kingdom of God. I'm like, no, that's not, that's not the way Jesus said it works. He says you got to be servant of all. In John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17, it says, so when he had washed their feet, taking his garment and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For if I have given you an example, I'm sorry, for as for I have given you an example, that you should do as I have done to you, most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. 
So to put this in context, this was, was at what we know as the Last Supper. This was the night that Jesus was betrayed, and they were uh, keeping the Passover uh, meal. And Jesus, all of a sudden, he, he gets up, he takes off his garments, he girds himself, and he, he takes the position of the lowest servant in the house. And he washed all of his disciples' feet. Now, in Jesus' day, washing the feet was a, a practical and needed thing. They walked around in, in sandals on dusty streets. Right, that's it was it was a needed thing for health, but that job was reserved for the lowest servant of the house. And so Jesus, he does this, and then he comes back to him. He says, "Do you understand what I just did?" He says, "You call me Lord and, and teacher." And again, the word Lord means master. So he's saying, "I, your master, have just washed your feet." He says, "I've shown you, given you an example." of what you should do for others. Because he even said, you call me Lord and teacher, he says, and you say you're right. So in other words, you're right. He says, I am Lord. I am your teacher. I am your master. But I've just set for you an example of how you should live. And he says, you know what? I'm paraphrasing Jesus here, so, so bear with me. But he's saying, I have humbled myself to wash the feet of my servants. Because the disciples would have been Jesus' servants. Everybody recognize that? right? He didn't like own them type of servants, but as, their, as his disciples, they did what he told them to do. You know? Anybody else think it was weird like when his, before his entry into Jerusalem, he tells them, hey, go into town, you're going to find this colt nobody's ever ridden, and I want you to just take it? <laughs> it's like, can you imagine if... if if I told you to do that, be like, hey, there's a car over here at Casey's. I want you to go over there and grab it for me. Keys are in it. <laughs> you guys would be like, whoa. But, <laughs> right, right, it's a brand new car. It'd come off the trailer, right? <laughs> so, uh, but you, he, he took that low position and he gave them an example. How humbling would it be for you? if Jesus came and washed your feet. Just the thought of it makes you want to tear up, don't it? It's just like, like I mean, I can understand Peter when Peter was like, no, no, hey, hey, don't do that. And Jesus tells him, he says, if I don't do it, you got no part with me. He's like, okay, then do everything. <laughs> Watch everything. But, uh, but Jesus showed us this example. So, but one of the things, catch this here, he says, I mean, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. That's what he said. Now, we're not bringing out the bowls and the towels. Everybody relax and keep your shoes on. Right. But but he he's bringing out a, a, this this point here. That I don't know if we, we always really see this because there's this word then. He says, I did this, and, and if I'm your Lord, he's connecting this. If I'm your Lord, then do this. That that's that's heavy, right? Jesus is like, in other words, what he's implying is if you ain't willing to, then I'm not really your Lord. You're really not connected with me if you're not willing. You know, if you, in, in preparation for this, I don't have any idea how much Jesus talks about being a servant. There's a lot. So, I, I mean, I just picked some highlights to go through this morning because we'd be here all day. Jesus talks about this a lot, about being a servant. So I, I asked the rhetorical question this morning, are you above serving? You know, I've heard horror stories of, past, of pastors who thought they were above serving. I don't know if you know this or not, but the word minister literally means to serve. That's what it means. You can't be a minister and not serve. And every time you minister to somebody, you're serving them. I mean, we're not always serving them by literally washing their feet or literally serving them a meal. But when we are ministering to somebody, we are providing something that they need. Right? And so when we're ministering Christ to people, we are serving people Jesus. 
because that's exactly what it means. To minister means to serve. And Jesus implies right here, he's saying, if I'm your Lord, then you need to be willing to serve and take the lowest position and do whatever it is. I tell you, one of the things I've seen, and I didn't actually write it in here, but I've seen this. There's people who serve, but they serve out of reluctance, and they gripe and they complain the whole time. Personally, I think you're better off just to say no. You can read through the Exodus and see how, how the murmuring and complaining, how well that worked out for them. An entire generation of people who died in the desert because they murmured and complained. Why God, that's why they had to wait 40 years because they had to wait for a new batch of people. It really is. <laughs> had, to get, had to get a whole new generation. Had to, had to wait 40 years for the other ones to die out and the babies to grow up a little bit. You know, as, as I was telling you before I started preaching this morning here, that it's an honor for me to serve you as your pastor. That's an honor to me. But, and I recognize that it is to be a pastor, to be a minister, means to serve. I understand that. You know, it, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm comfortable up here preaching. I'm not comfortable down here when, you know, we're doing the appreciation thing. Because that, that's not why I'm here today. You know, I appreciate it. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate it, but I, it's not about me. But are you above serving? Because you know what Jesus said? If you're not above him, you're not above Jesus. And so Jesus served. He served everywhere he went. He healed the sick, brought the dead to life, fed the hungry. Right? I mean, he, he cast out demons. He served everywhere he went. That's what he did. He served and served and then served some more. And see, the, the, the thought that's hard for us to understand here is that Jesus is the creator of everything. The heavens and the earth, the heavens includes outer space and everything that's out there we don't know about. Everything that ever was, ever is, and ever will be, he's the creator of it. He is omnipotent. Jesus is, he says, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Okay, he was there at creation. He's always been, he's this eternal being, There's, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's all this stuff, and yet he humbled himself to wash the feet of the people who sinned against him. You know, that's a, he, set a, he set a high standard for us. We are not greater than Jesus. You know, he concludes here, he says in verse 17 that I just read, he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In other words, Jesus is saying, you know what? You want to be blessed? you got to learn to serve some people. That's pretty simple. I tell you what, there's been times in my flesh I've done things I didn't want to do, things that I, I did for the Lord, times, man, but you know what? Never once regretted it. The fourth, the thing, whatever it was, my, I was like, ah. But then afterwards, I got walking away with a smile on my face saying, man, I'm really glad I did this. I was blessed because I was willing to serve. I was willing to minister, even when I didn't feel like it. Here at New Life, we want to serve all people. Those within the church, those outside of the church, the saved, the lost. Servant of all. It may, might, might sting a little bit, but are there people you won't serve? You know, sinners, homosexuals, Muslims, the addicts, the prostitutes, the homeless, the sick, the old, the children. Sure, we could probably make a really long list 
right? There's, there are there are people that we're not comfortable with. There's, but yet, they still fit within all. All is an absolute statement. It's all inclusive. And I'm going to tell you why here, why it's important that we're willing to serve all. Because Jesus died for all. You know, sometimes we can get on a high horse and think, yes, Jesus saved me. He's so lucky. He's so lucky to have me. You know, I was worth it to him, but I don't know about this guy. You know, no, that's not quite the way it works. We were all headed for the same hell. Right? Scripture says, tells us that for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. It tells us that the wages of sin is death and eternal death. So we were all headed to the same place, which put us all on the same level. We were all lost. We were all condemned. But Jesus died for all of us. He died for all of us to save all of us. And Scripture tells us that he's not willing that any would should come to repentance. I mean, I didn't say that right. <laughs> he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All right, all right. Don't take that one out of context. All right, all right. He doesn't want any of us to perish. So he died for all of us. Even the people that reject him, he died for them. Because he loves all. It's not in his will that they're going to go to hell. That's the point. He won't. If Jesus had his way, every single person on earth would be saved. Because it says all. And I'm telling you, we should, we should show the love of Christ by serving all. It doesn't mean that we, we condone their behaviors. We don't condone their sin. But what did, who did Jesus spend time with? He was labeled by religious people as being a friend of sinners. People, people thought that that people thought that Jesus wouldn't be hanging out with them if he's a, this man of God. He's this this prophet, as a lot of them thought he was at the time. They're thinking he shouldn't be talking with them. You know, they're like when the woman was washing his feet with her hair and her tears, and they're thinking in their hearts, saying, "If he knew who she was, he wouldn't be letting her touch him." But that's not who Jesus was. He came. To love all, and he served all. And so we, that, I'm going to tell you, that's how you show the love of Christ is through serving. You can talk till you're blue in the face, but you're still not a friend. <laughs> right? No, we've all heard the adage, nobody cares what you know until they know how much you care. There's truth to that. But how do people know that we care? It isn't by what we say. You know, I'm sure I could probably go buy a little robot that, that just says, I love you, Pastor Pete, all the time. That don't mean nothing. The words could be there, but it doesn't mean that there's anything there. It's just words. Talk is cheap. We know that. But yet actions speak louder than words. So, so when we serve. So let me ask you. Is your pride holding you back from serving? I think there's a lot of people that, that this is the case. Their pride keeps them from serving other people. You know, it's like like they're saying, well, you might say, Pastor Pete, you want me to take the low position? You want me to wash somebody's feet or clean their toilet or something like that? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly what I'm saying. You know, I'm saying that, that you're willing to serve whatever it is. In whatever capacity it is. In First Peter chapter five, verses five through six, five and six here it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself selves to your elders. But get this. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due time. Tell you that one of the keys to, to serving is humility. It's pretty hard to serve if you're not humble. You know, uh, you know, sometimes 
with you. I think of some famous people. Think of somebody who uh, Taylor Swift. I'll always get Taylor Swift mad about that. So just take Taylor Swift for a second. When she goes to a concert and or she performs a concert, she's not serving you. That's not that's not what she's doing. She's being served with 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 attention. And I'm not bashing anybody here. I'm just saying the difference here of understanding that it takes humility to serve somebody. It takes takes being willing to to swallow our pride, do things that are uncomfortable to serve and to help somebody else. Because that is again, serving is ministry. Right? So so humility is the key is the key here. Um so as we've already talked about, we've all sinned, so we all deserve to go to hell. But yet Jesus saved us, saved us, not of our own doing, but out of his love, what he did for us. And that makes us no better than anybody else. Tell you what, you ever feel like your pride's coming up? Just remind yourself. Pick the person you can't stand the most and just remember that Jesus died for them just as much as he did you. That, that, that'll, that'll humble you. The person that you just can't stand. Some of us, you know, you want you run across people in life that they're just like fingernails on a chalkboard, right? And it's like, I can't stand that guy. But yet Jesus died for him just as much as for, for him as he did you. You're not special. Right? Sorry to pop your bubble. Right? It's we're not special in the, in that regard. Scripture even tells us God's very clear that he doesn't show favoritism. He's not, he doesn't show partiality. He doesn't handpick that he loves Joe more than he loves Wade. He didn't do that. He says that they could both be knuckleheads and he still loves them both. Right? Just playing with you guys. But it's still true. But it's still true. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that. Uh, Mark used to say all the time, he says, if you want to get to the rooftop, you got to catch the elevator of faith. Because in, in this right here, verse 6 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You know, when we're willing to humble ourselves, God exalts us. There's a lot of people trying to climb to the top and they can't figure out why they never get there. Because they haven't understood this principle that God's put into place that, that, in order to be exalted, you need to humble yourself. Elevator to faith. Scripture tells us that Moses was the most humble man that ever lived. And yet he led roughly a million people out of Egypt. He confronted Pharaoh, the most powerful person in the world at the time. What, like ten times? At least. It's like, it's a miracle. It's, it's got to be a miracle of God that Pharaoh just didn't have him killed. Right? I mean, that, that alone was a miracle. But yet, he was humble. He was humble before God. He recognized that he, he lacked the ability in and of his own wisdom and ability to lead these people. He, he recognized he had to rely on God to lead them. Think about how humble Jesus was. He was born in a barn. He was homeless. He used a stone for a pillow, and yet he was the creator of the heavens and earth. We can't even fathom that level of humility. I mean, it's just, I think we're, our minds are just, cannot, we cannot comprehend from going from that high to that low. Those of us in this room right now can't hardly comprehend the idea of using a stone for a pillow. We complain about our memory foam beds and stuff, right? It's so hot, it's too cold, right? <laughs> and, and yet the most powerful being that, that will and has ever existed, the eternal God, humbled himself to that. Not only did he humble himself to that life, but he humbled himself to the cross. You know how much willpower it took to keep him there? How much love it took to keep him there? Because he had the power to end it all at any moment. He had the power to bypass it if he wanted to. That, granted, that would have left us all lost. Would have left.
love does hold balance. But the amount of humility that it would take to say, I have the power to come off this cross and not do this. I can't even fathom that. Because I don't think, there's none of us in this room that should be able to do that. Right? That's something that only Jesus can do. You know, we need to be humble. You know, there's, there's the, uh, no, I don't know what you call it. I've heard it a bunch of times, but they say to treat the janitor with the same respect you treat the CEO. fellow humans all on this earth, we, we'll show respect to each other, regardless of a person's position, their life, the mistakes they've made. There's, uh, it's a, to me, it's just so humbling to just think about that you were humble to say, he died just as much as me and everybody else that he lived with, but yet he still died for me. He still hung on the cross. If you were the only person to ever receive the gospel, he still would have went to the cross. But but his his atonement paid for everything. In Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 11, it says, So he told a parable to those who were invited, and when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you come, or come, invited you and him come and say to you, "Give place to this man." And then you begin, be, begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go sit at the lowest place, that when you are invited, or that when he who invited you comes, may he may say to you, "Friend, go up higher." Then you will have glory in the presence of the house who sat at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, Jesus talked a lot about this, too. You know, he's saying, you know what? Even if you are somebody, you're nobody. You know, you know I'm not saying that to be making people feel bad about yourself. But in reality, you know, it's saying, you know what? We, we, we need to take the humble. Ask yourself, you know, what kind of people do you like? Do you, do you like the people that are humble or the people that are full of themselves? I, I got a feeling the, the, the first one probably gets everybody in trouble, <laughs> you know? But yet, if we're full of ourselves and we try to go minister the gospel, we're walking around with a bunch of pride, thinking we're better than everybody else. How effective do you think you'll be in that? you're going to find yourself not effective at all. So tell yourself to be humble. You know, we're talking about serving and, and this culture of serving. Jesus, again, he talked a lot about, about serving. And and uh, this next is one of my, my favorite passages. In, uh, it's, it's in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Jesus is talking here again. He says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep and from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, and but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You know, Jesus makes, makes something really clear here. When we serve others, we serve Jesus. 
If you want to know how to serve Jesus, it's by serving others. You can't serve Jesus without serving other people. It doesn't work. You know, do I believe that, that Jesus... Does he desire and does he love when we come together and we worship and we sing songs to him? Does, is he pleased when we pay our tithe and, and when we follow his commandments and you know we're doing these things? Absolutely. But that's just being obedient. That's not serving. If you want to serve Jesus, the only way to serve Jesus is by serving other people. That's it. Can anyone else think of seriously something than how you truly serve Jesus? He's, Jesus himself was a sacrifice that paid for our sins. We don't have, there's nothing we can bring that's going to top Jesus himself. But he says that, that when we feed the hungry, or we give drink to the thirsty, or we, we minister to the stranger and clothe the naked, visit the sick, visit those that are in prison, when we do those things, he says, we're doing it to him. He receives our, serve, our service, how we serve other people. He receives it personally. That's pretty important then, ain't it? You know. Uh, and if we continue on in that same passage, picking up at verse 41. It says, Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then Jesus will answer them, saying, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You know, some people draw a line between serving Jesus and serving people. You come in here and sing hallelujah all you want. And, and I think we should. But that's really not serving Jesus. You know, years ago, I took this passage and I, I, I kind of made a checklist for myself. Even though it's not what God's called me to do, like it is in like my area of ministry full time, I made sure I've done everything on this list. I wanted to be sure that, that I, I had done it, I, have, I have, was willing to do it. You know, and, and for me, it was, it was just a thing of not saying that, and I would do them again. Right? Well, I know that there are some people who are called to, say, prison ministry, right? Um, there, there's people who are called specific to that. Um, if you haven't done it, I suggest you do. Or you'll at least know what Jesus is talking about. I can understand if you don't do it. Coming from with this. But people make it, they, they try to draw a line between serving Jesus and serving people. But Jesus served people. Jesus told us to serve people. Jesus has basically, he just now told us, not basically, he just put it really clearly that serving people is serving him. Because Jesus is about, he died for people. He didn't die just so that there would be a church. He didn't die just so there would be something written about him. Right? He died for people. So here at New Life, one of the things we've been doing pretty good at is feeding the hungry. Right? Right? We, 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 we're, we like food. We like to share food. So we have things, we're doing things like the food pantry, the mobile food pantry, our Wednesday night dinners, our, our first Sunday fellowship meals. We've, done these, we've been doing these outreaches to teachers and feeding people. And you know what? And a lot of the people aren't really destitute of food, yet we're still ministering. We're still showing the love of Christ to people through food. I love food. That's, that's one of my favorite things, is, is food. And so, you know what? 
when Joe, for my birthday, made me what they called a, a meat cake, which is it was a fancy meatloaf. Uh, you know what? That ministered to me. It was very good. Very good. <laughs> so, um, but you know, in the future here, one of the things I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to put together some teams. <laughs> yeah, work on the humility, right, Joe? <laughs> uh, right, but but yeah, we're one of the things I want to do here in the future is is put together some teams, team the opportunities to serve. You know, the fact is is that I might be the pastor, but I'm not the only one called to serve. I don't know if you know this, but you guys are called to serve too. That's that's kind of the way it works. We're all in this thing together, right? And so, you know, some of the things that we're going to want to put together is, is like a hospitality team, a security team, visitation team. You know, we're already got a meal team, but we'll probably make it a little bit more uh, final, I guess, what's the word? We'll give it a name. I already come up with a cool name for it. We're going to call it Meal Team 6. <laughs> yeah. You'll remember that, won't you? <laughs> Meal Team Six, yep. Hey, Amen. And so, you know, so in the future here, you know, I want opportunities for everybody to be, have a chance to be able to serve people because of serving Jesus. I want you guys, in, my, in the, the example that Jesus gave in Matthew 25, I want you all to be on the sheep side, not the goat side. Amen. Nobody wants to be on the goat side. The end doesn't well, it doesn't end well for the goats. Right? We want to be on the sheep side. We want to be on the right hand side. Actually, I'm doing that backwards because sheep are on the right. But I'm left handed, so. All right. That's probably true, but but you know what? One of the things I I there's more than just teams though. You know what? As a as a church and, and with our interaction with other people. There's, time, there's opportunities to serve all the time, you know. Um, I know around here, we serve like family, you know. Chris pulled up, needed an oil check. That ain't no big deal. I can check oil, right? And, uh, you know, huh? Well, she made it easy, right? She even, she even popped the hood from the inside, right? But, you know, to me, that's... That's not a big deal to serve them, things like that, you know. Um, but if one of us is broke down, if I broke down, you know, I'm calling one of you. All right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, All right. I mean, I know, I know who I'm calling first, the guy with the truck and the trailer. So, uh, but but seriously, we. We serve each other like family uh, because we are family. You know, there's things that, that if we're broke down somewhere and we need help on the side of the road, or if we, we got the body of a car we need to pick up and set on a stand or something that, that's happened before as well. You know, there's people that we would call and we say, hey, can you give me a hand with this? You know what? Those are opportunities to serve. You know, and uh, maybe somebody calls and says, hey, my... My plumbing's backed up or something, and, and I need some help with it. Or my faucet's leaking or whatever. There's all sorts of ways that, that we can serve. You know, there's, um, you know, sometimes people have been sick, and, and so you, we do kind of the meal train thing. You know, we, we, again, back to the food. Food's the easy way to serve. Um, somebody needs something moved heavy or that you can help with. You know, if I got something heavy I need help moving with, I know who I'm calling there too. Um, but you know, there's there's a, a lot of you helped me last weekend with barricades. I needed help with that. On, on behalf of Teen Challenge. I needed help with it. You know, and we had church people that stepped up for that, and they helped. Um, you know, those are those are ways we serve. I mean. Sitting in a lawn chair, that's, that's, you can serve by sitting in a lawn chair. That's pretty, pretty great, really. 
uh, and it wasn't raining last weekend. That was made it better. But you know, right? But we don't want to be self-serving. You know, scripture. We have a New Testament scripture that tells us that we're not supposed to be doing things out of selfish ambition and stuff. The culture of our world around us is all about me, me, me. What can I get? What? How can? What's it going to benefit me? When you read through the things that Jesus said about the kingdom of God, it's a polar opposite. You know, Luke tells us today, you know, if you want to get to the top, step on anybody that gets in the way to climb that ladder. Jesus says, you want to get to the top, go to the basement. Take that low position, that, that humility. You know, I'm going to trust Jesus over the culture of our world. You know, so... Got a couple of verses I want to share with you as I, as I conclude this morning. And one's out of Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45. It says, But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, Jesus makes it pretty clear, you know, that, that, that he's called us to serve. He says he didn't even come to be served, but to serve. And the greatest service he did for us was going to the cross taking that taking the penalty of our sins upon himself so jesus come to serve and he said that we should follow his example that we should humble ourselves serve him by serving others and here here in new life that's i really that's already a, a part of our culture but i think it's part of our culture i'd love to see grow of learning how to serve up one another. You know, we want to serve each other. We want to serve our community. And we want to teach others how to serve Jesus by serving others. So one final scripture here before we leave, just kind of a, to leave you with something to ponder, is out of James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Hello. <laughs> All right, so James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just once again, we just thank you. We praise you for the opportunity to be here and to, to, uh, to worship you and hear from your word. Lord, I ask that you would give us all a servant's heart, Lord, a desire to share your love with people around us by serving, Lord. Help us to not just be, be ministers of word, but Lord, that we'd also be ministers of, of deed, Lord, that we would we could humble ourselves to the lowest position. Lord, that we'd have a heart of joy, even as we even as we serve in low positions, Lord, because we recognize we're serving you. We're furthering your kingdom. We're being obedient to what you've called us to do. Lord, I'd ask that as we leave here today, Lord, that, that each one of us, our heart to serve would just grow, Lord. Lord, I'd, I'd ask that, that your church would be known by our service to others. Lord, we just thank you. We give you praise for this this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen.